Now that the major components have been installed, and the CMOS information has been checked, the PC is built and almost ready to use. Although assembled and working, this system cannot be used to achieve common tasks such as storing files, using applications or connecting to the internet. To make this system usable, an operating system is required. An operating system provides a user interface which allows applications to be used and data to be manipulated. Essentially, the operating system will allow human input to be translated into something that can be understood by the computer hardware. Traditionally, Microsoft have dominated the operating system market and most PC users are familiar with Microsoft Windows. It's important to know that Microsoft products are not the only choice of PC operating system. Linux is an open source operating system that is rapidly gaining in popularity. There are many Linux distributions such as Ubuntu, Mandriva, Red Hat and SUSE, to name only a few. Many distributions are available as free downloads. When choosing an operating system there are a number of factors to consider. Operating systems are created to take advantage of current hardware and allow for future advances. For example, a 20 year old computer will not have the processing power, available RAM or hard drive space to run the latest version of Microsoft Windows. If you are unsure, you should look up the minimum and recommended specifications set out by the operating system vendor. Here we have shown the minimum specifications to run Windows 7. Using Google search, it is possible to also find minimum specifications for other operating systems. If the PC you are working with is nearer the minimum specs rather than the recommended specs, it may be wiser to choose an older operating system that requires less resources. When choosing an operating system you may be asked to select either a 32-bit or 64-bit edition. You may recall that computers work on bits. We looked at an 8-bit number earlier on in the coursework. We represented this by using 8 transistors that were either on or off. So the number 1 in binary was 000, 000, 000, 01 and 2, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000. A 32-bit number is really not that much different other than it uses 32 bits, or in our example 32 transistors. So number 1 would be 31 zeros and a 1 at the end. 2 would be 30 zeros followed by a 1, then a 0. So what's the advantage of increasing the number of bits? To understand this, we must first appreciate that the CPU can do only one single thing at a time. We can make it seem to do more with some clever programming or have more than one CPU, thus causing it to multitask. But essentially, it will only do the one single job before moving on to the next. Or it follows a to-do list. Each of these items is called a cycle or part of a cycle. We can add things to this to-do list, such as ask it to complete a mathematical calculation or manipulate some graphics on the screen. Let's say it is the latter to move some 32 bits of information from one part of the screen using an 8-bit system. We know that the screen is built up of pixels, so we can represent this by a series of circles. The graphics we wish to move is represented by the blue circles, and the area we wish to move them to is represented by the black circles. With 8 bits, it would take the first 8 items and move them. We'll then continue to return to the next 8 bits and move them. After 4 trips, it would have moved all the information. But it had to do this in 4 cycles. Now if we bear in mind that the CPU is not only looking after the screen, but also tracking many thousands of other housekeeping jobs, such as checking the keyboard to see if a key has been pressed, or if the mouse has been moved, or even if sound is being played. So between transferring the first 8 bits, it would move on to the next job. After completing all its jobs, it would then return to the screen and transfer the next 8 bits. If we think about it, and the CPU just did move the whole 32 bits, everything would cease for that period. So if we pressed a key during this time, then the CPU would just ignore it. With a 32-bit system, moving the data could be done in one cycle, so technically four times faster. And with a 64-bit system, it would even be faster still. 
So why not have a 128-bit system or even a 256-bit system? Mainly because of memory limitations. We can see this if we looked at a 32-bit number. Decimal 1 in 32-bit binary is 31 zeros and a 1. In 64-bit binary, a 1 would be 63 bits and a 1. Mathematically, there is no difference between these two. We can think of it as two baskets, a 32-bit basket and a 64-bit basket. If both just had one potato in them, then there is little difference. Except with the 64-bit basket, you could move more potatoes at once, or much larger chunks of data at the same time. Another limiting factor is the physical layout. In theory, for each address line, you should have a data line. As an example, here we have an 8-bit system showing one RAM chip. In theory, 8 of these lines will carry the address of the data we want to receive. And 8 of these is where the data within the IC will be held. Two pins are used for power, positive and negative. This means for each RAM that is designed like this, in a 64-bit architecture, each IC will have to have 64 address lines and 64 data lines. If we compare this with the actual size of this 8-bit chip, we can appreciate the physical problems that the motherboard manufacturers are up against. Although this is not impossible, it does add to the overall cost of the production. A confusing issue is the 32-bit versus 64-bit memory. Technically, the amount of memory that can be supported by a 32-bit operating system, such as Windows 7 Ultimate, is 4 gigabytes. Although you will find just over half a gig will be used by the devices within the computer. With a 64-bit Windows 7 Ultimate, then it would be 192 gigabytes, and once again just over half a gig for the devices. But the most important issue is the motherboard. Because of limited physical factors, some motherboards will not support more than 8 gigabytes. So you should first check with the manufacturer's specifications before undertaking any memory upgrades. Finally, we should appreciate we can install a 32-bit operating system into a 64-bit system. But you cannot install a 64-bit operating system into a 32-bit system.